As you know, our life is surrounded by computer technology. It shapes our life. We use it in our work, the tools for work. We use it for entertainment. We use it for keeping in touch with our friends and family, for getting information. But behind every computer artifact, there is an ideology. And it shapes what gets made. And it shapes what we can do and what we can't do. In the early days, computers were tools for work. And the ideology behind that was that faster and cheaper is better. And there's nothing wrong with that. But in the very hire and fire environment of the United States, nobody cared what people thought about their, their tools. They were paid to do a job and they just had to get on with it. And so the ideology behind that was the people have got to adjust to the software, not vice versa. But in Scandinavia, there was a very different idea, a very different ideology of work. And there, engineers and workers developed together the software in order that it should be efficient, but also satisfying and enjoyable for the users. So the ideology there was very different was that there's more to life than efficiency. But now, computer, computers aren't just tools. They shape the life of everybody, and not just professionals, ordinary people too. Jaron Lanya was a, a Silicon Valley pioneer in the 80s. And he's recently written a book, and he writes, it's impossible to work with information technology without also engaging in social engineering. And he went on to say that a tiny group of engineers can make decisions that affect millions. Of course, artifacts reflect the worldview of the people who make them. It's not surprising. But if we think of the great centers of software development in North America, they're mostly populated by young, male, childless engineers. And they think nothing of working late, working away at a problem, and add to this the fact that to seem keen, you should work late, you get this culture where work becomes before everything, before family, before leisure, before culture. So perhaps it's not surprising that as Ben Hammersley, uh, the Wired writer, said lately in Milan, that the BlackBerry Mobile, which was the first to allow people to do email on the go, the ideology behind that is that work comes first, and people have got to be available wherever they are, whenever they are. Lately, there was uh, an article in the New York Times, and one of the people commenting on it uh, equated effectively time when you're not at work with idle time. Now, in English, particularly in America, uh, idleness has this Puritan overtone of a vice. But I think here in Europe, we've got a different idea about the relationship of work and leisure. In Volkswagen, for instance, they've started blocking emails to their workforce uh, after the end of the day. The ideology there is that we should work to live, not live to work. The whole business model of Google is based on the idea that you don't own your identity, you don't own your, your data. It belongs to anybody who can harvest it, measure it, sell it without your consent. But recently, very, very recently, there's been a, a ruling in the uh, European Court of Justice which has said that people have some rights to be forgotten. And actually, Google have complied with this already. But it's not just Google. Uh, if I go to the Corriere homepage, um, you see up there a little red number, 19. That's the number of sites that are tracking me. And with this little application, I can find out who it is, and I, and I can block them. Let's think about the worldview that brought us Facebook. Facebook suggests to us that success is equal to popularity. But are your Facebook friends really friends? Should we really reduce judgment to, I don't like it, I do? Couldn't it be richer? It's their worldview, their choice, and obviously lots of people use it and like it and find it fun. 
but it's now affecting millions of people worldwide, often with very different worldviews. Mitch Kapoor was the designer of Lotus 123, one of the, the most popular programs for the IBM PC. And in 1990, he wrote a software design manifesto. And as he said, one of the main reasons most computer software is so abysmal is that it's not designed at all, but merely engineered. If we think, let's just go back. If we think of the physical world, it's architects who bring together the cultural and the engineering side. So they make buildings that stand up, keep the rain out, but they also make buildings that reflect society's social mores, their values, uh, their moral values, their social values, their aesthetic values. And in the digital world, it's the interaction designer that does this. They're the architects of the digital world, the people who bring together culture and engineering. When I and my colleague are teaching interaction designers, and he's an architect, we say not what software did you use or how does it work. We say, what's the social effect of your design? What implicit meanings does it convey? What is the appropriate emotional tone? Does it fit its cultural context? But things are changing. Companies now are beginning to realize that they need designers who can put together the technology with culture. So what if there were different ideologies that shaped application development? The question in the past was, what can we do? But now I think it should be, what do we want to do? What should we do? Technology should, technology should reflect our lived lives better. Apple Maps is based on the American idea of the city, which is blocks of buildings connected by roads. But in Venice here, the landmarks are campy, open spaces. If we look here, uh, this, this, we're in Campo Santa Margarita, but if you didn't know the city, could you find the campo? But OpenStreetMap, which uses crowdsourcing, local crowdsourcing, to affect the details, represents our lived experience much, much better. Or what if mothers were the designers? I was a bit skeptical about this project, but then I realized that one of the group was a mother herself, and they designed this app that allowed a parent to delineate an area in in the city where their child could play, and it would send them an update immediately they strayed from it. So this application not only allowed children to play more freely in the campi, but it also built social capital amongst mothers, encouraging them to help each other or look out for each other's children. So it, it changed behavior as well as providing a useful little tool. This satirical video uh, hit a nerve. It's been seen by more than four, 40 million people on YouTube. I saw him pull out of the parking lot and turn right, and the box was still stuck under his car. So who knows how long he was driving with that box under his car. I like bet he got home, he pulled into his driveway. Out in the sky. I'm not, I'm not. Wow. You're like, it's not, it's not real. I don't think it's real. Oh, I don't think it's maybe real. Maybe there's a, like, I see the lineup for cars. We see the Empire State Building is like, really close to it. So it's a good thing. <laughs> We've all been there, and it was just to confront these problems of 
the relationship of our social mores and the technology that Lorna Ross invented the phone glove. And the idea of this is that you could speak behind your hand, politely, rather than broadcasting to the world. Way. And the switches are flush to the glove. This project uh, was designed specifically as an anti-Facebook project. Francesco wanted to design a social software where you were encouraged to do things together rather than just show off. And it's a, a, a site where people can make music uh, together. It was a student project uh, incubated in H Farm, our local successful incubator, and they got 30,000 users. Sounds is not just for professional musicians. Users can work with high quality recording devices or the built-in microphone on their computers. What's more, an iPhone application is available to stay in touch with your friends' music ideas so you can collaborate with them at any time, any place. Founds, what music are you thinking? This last project uh, was a project to design a system that would allow people to keep in touch with loved ones far away. So in this solution, something, an action in one place, has an effect in another. Place has an effect. students realize that you don't always want to make a phone call. Sometimes just a little light, a puff of air is enough, like a caress in the physical world. Applications, systems, computer systems, allow us to do some things, encourage some things, discourage others. So ask yourselves, if you think about the applications that you use every day, do they, as well as taking into account efficiency, uh, ease of use, do they take into account the full range and complexity of human life? And what ideologies lurk behind the technology you use every day? Does it fit with your worldview? Does it allow you to do what you want? Or must you do what it wants? Thank you.